In this video, I'm going over Windows versus Linux. Now, this isn't gonna be your average comparison video because honestly, a lot of people already know about the cons and things that they don't like about each of one of these operating systems. However, I'm gonna lay out the things I like about each one and what I miss when I'm on, let's say if I'm on Windows, what I miss about Linux, and when I'm on Linux, what I miss about Windows. And really that way you can kind of see the strengths of each operating system and help you choose. Also, when I'm going over this, I'm going to try and lay out a lot of educational things that I do in each one of these operating systems so you'll able to be able to pick up and actually learn something new and maybe even make yourself a little more efficient and enjoy that specific operating system a bit better. So let's go ahead and jump into this. This is going to be a lot different format than pretty much any uh, comparison video out there just because I think this is going to help so many users and while you may not be on one of these distributions today or one of these operating systems today uh, this will help you at least understand the transition period how it actually works and uh, that way you know maybe in the future you might switch and be able to actually have a better time and have a better understanding of each one of these operating systems This video is brought to you by Datapacket. They offer dedicated servers with unshared 10 gigabit connections around the world. They also don't have any contracts. You pay for what your business needs and no more. Link is in the description. So let's start out with Windows. There's no surprise here. I've made a lot of Windows videos bashing like their privacy, how they've changed a lot of interfaces, updates going bad, and, and, that, and that's not really what I'm gonna cover here. Uh, I'm gonna actually jump on the desktop here of Windows and kind of show you how I get around. But the reason why people use Windows is not really so much a, a choice or it's actually kind of a lack of choices is why most people use it and that really deals with it's what so many people already know it's familiar it's one of those things that i grew up with windows i always use windows for the past 10 20 years and when i have a problem i know how to fix it almost immediately and when you go to another operating system it, it just is so foreign there's things you have to actually teach yourself and, and really learn to utilize that operating system correctly. And that's a really hard thing to do. And I, I think too many people discount, hey, you're a Windows user, you need to just switch to Linux. And that is not how it works because Linux, there is a learning curve with that. So I understand that's why people stick with Windows, but let's jump on the desktop and kind of show you how I use Windows and the things I like about it and the familiarity that I'm so used to when it comes to Windows, when it comes to fixing problems and those types of things. So many people look at the actual desktop and I do like the actual layout of Windows and one thing I kind of mimic a lot when I come to uh, Linux with the start menu, how intuitive all that is when you don't have all the junk cluttering it up, it's actually not too bad. I like to kind of show a couple shortcuts like the right clicking of the Windows key on Windows 10 gives you a nice little shortcut to many system functions that I use. So as far as a lot of the shortcuts in here, which I really like, uh, that I use often is our device manager. So you can actually troubleshoot any devices plugged in, which is really nice. Uh, right click, apps and features. You can go ahead and uninstall certain programs in here. So you can go ahead and pull this in. Now, sometimes this doesn't work all that great. And I like to use the old version. And to use the old version, I like to right click, hit run, and then I type appwiz.cpl. And this pulls in uh, this version of it, which again, is, is pretty nice. I kind of prefer this just because of what I'm used to and uh, a lot of things like turning Windows features on and off, uh, whether .NET, uh, SMB.1.0, other things you can actually enable uh, right through this menu using the old style. And if we go into here, there's still other things that I like to use. Network connections pulls up the newer version of it, which I don't like. Uh, disk management, if you pull this in, you can actually modify your partitions and other things you can see in here, which this is a nice one. This actually hasn't changed since Windows 7. 
Computer management is another one that is really utilized a lot. You can go ahead and change like your users, other things uh, directly from here. Uh, the big thing most system admins use on Windows-based systems is Event Viewer, because if you come into here, you can actually kind of see uh, what's going on with your system. So if it's acting funny or it's shutting down or, or just doing something that you don't like, you can easily pull this up and kind of see, hey, what issues is my system having right now? So if, if you look here, you can kind of see errors that the system's currently having. Um, now, some of these are gonna be nonsensical, but some of these really will help lead you to a solution if you're having problems with your Windows system. So Event Viewer is amazingly powerful. I really love its layout when it comes to Windows. As far as shared folders and other things that are in here, I don't really use shared folders much anymore because I usually only share one or two folders out of each Windows box if I'm gonna share a folder at all. And then task scheduler, a lot of times I'm coming in here and actually changing and ripping out certain things, uh, but this is just kind of another way uh, some people actually go ahead and uh, kind of institute some adware. Like a good, good example of this is AMD thanking URL. I obviously don't need this. I can just like delete this because I don't want this to ever run and it's just taking up resources and other bloat and it's a way that a lot of people hide some of the things in here. So you can actually kind of look at modify link update. What the heck is that? You look at actions and this looks to be like another AMD kind of a bloatware that they install on Windows. But uh, you can change and delete these. This is actually in there twice. so. I I probably will just go ahead and remove both of these as well. Um, but this is just good information to have um, when you're actually managing your computer. Computer management does a decent job. And again, this is an older screen uh, from Windows 7, which I still use quite often. And then, of course, you have PowerShell. This is more for your system admins. There's a, a lot of times I'm in here, but I understand most users don't use PowerShell, but I've grown accustomed to it and, and actually enjoy it. Now, Besides PowerShell, you can also do Command Prompt, which is different. Some people confuse the two, but if you just do Run and then CMD, it'll actually pull in your Command Prompt. If you don't want to right-click and hit Run, or let's say it's not there, you can hit your Windows key and press R, and it pulls up the Run box, so that's what I'm gonna do now. Now, there's a couple commands I like to use almost on a daily basis when it comes to Windows. Probably the biggest one is ncpa.cpl. This is actually where you find all your network connections, and this has been around. It's almost hidden now. It's buried in a menu system somewhere in Windows 10. I don't. I couldn't even tell you because I just use this command to launch it each time. This gives us a status of our uh, network connection. We can do changes, disable things. Like let's say I want to disable uh, IPv6 because I don't want it kind of going wild when almost all my stuff's on IPv4. Uh, so I can disable IPv6 here by just going into the display adapter properties and unchecking uh, IPv6. But uh, this is just some of the features in network connections. So many people are so familiar with this, and some people even thought, hey, it almost disappeared from Windows 10. That's how buried it is. But no, it's still there. And other people missed the old control panel. And if you just type control in the run box, you can actually pull up the old Windows 7 control panel, browse around, get to what you need uh, fairly quickly. I really enjoy this view a lot better. It seems more intuitive. I'm able to get to things a lot easier than messing around with uh, the new Metro menu system, which I think is atrocious. And then you go to run, and let's say you want Windows Firewall, just remember WF for Windows Firewall MSC. And uh, if you're having trouble remembering the .msc, just think Microsoft Control. So MSC, and that gives you control. So that gives you Windows Defender Firewall where you can change inbound rules, make your own rules, uh, kind of change certain aspects of your Windows here if you're having problems where a program's just not able to communicate with an outside world or maybe something else in your local area network. Other commands that I use, uh, and this is kind of an obscure one, this actually goes back to uh, Windows 2000 server, I think is one of the first commands I learned this. Control user passwords two. And this actually pulls in uh, the actual old school user accounts list. And that gives you the ability to like, let's say auto login and other aspects you can actually use this right here for. 
Now, as far as everything else in here, uh, it's kind of funny. I wanted to lay out the gamut when it comes to how old Windows is. Really, all they've done is just continue to slap these new sleek skins on top of a really old system. It's just what we're familiar with. So I hope you found these commands useful. So that's kind of what my thoughts are on Windows. Uh, there's not too much other reasons why people use Windows. I don't think anybody consciously that understands all the operating system choices would go ahead and say, oh, well, Windows is a thing. Mainly because a lot of the actual internal workings, its kernel, all these things are, are from the 90s. There's really fundamentally not much improvements on Windows. Uh, I made a video saying Windows 10 just keeps getting worse, and that dealt with like a lot of its updates that have actually gone bad and awry, and, and how the actual operating system feels worse than it did three years ago, where uh, obviously on Linux side of things, it has substantially gotten better over the years. Like five years ago, if you tried Linux, it's a considerably worse experience than it is today, where a lot of people, when it comes to Windows, you go back 10 years to Windows 7 and people are like, I love this. This is so much better than how Windows is today, which is hilarious because in the past 10 years, there really hasn't been any earth shattering improvements when it comes to Windows, which is a bit sad, but that's just the world we're living in. And we're Linux, you go back 10 years ago and it's dang near unusable uh, for the average user. So that's why uh, I kind of wanted to make this video is just kind of showcase the two differences. So with that, let's transition into Linux. Okay, so now we have the Linux desktop. Now, obviously, I've done a lot of tweaking to get it to look like this, and that's what kind of my channel's about as far as making Linux look sexy and awesome and even better than Windows. Because most people coming from Windows look at Linux and it feels kind of archaic. It, it doesn't feel new and awesome out of the gate. And it really, that's why I say it's a learning curve when it comes to Linux. But this is kind of what I'm rocking right now on my studio PC here, and I really enjoy the look, the feel, the fact that my CPU is 1% idle and not 20% like Windows 10, and then also my RAM usage isn't like 2 or 3 gigs with the stock window installed. Now, I'm running like Barrier and other things in the background. Some uh, hardcore Linux minimalists go ahead and bring this down to like 120 megs worth of RAM usage. So Linux is great, especially for older PCs because you're able to run anything pretty much on it. Now, with all that said, uh, I really love this look and feel after changing it. Like when I was talking about Windows, uh, I have hotkeys for everything so I can just pull everything up with a hotkey. And let's say I don't like this file explorer and I want to install something that just looks different, more uh, a sleek and not so technical like the, the Dolphin file explorer, I can easily change it. And that's the beauty of Linux. So I'm gonna just hit my hotkey to pull up my terminal and we're just gonna install Nautilus. It's 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 another file explorer. So with that, it'll go ahead, go out to the internet, download all of Nautilus for me and install it. Another aspect of Linux that's different is the installation. Instead of going up and pulling up a website, downloading an executable file that may contain viruses, everything's built into Linux or almost probably 90 plus percent of the software out there where you just install the software. Also, on that same front, everything's free, everything's open for the most part. There's still some outliers to that, but everything's just kind of built in and it just makes it nice. So let's say I want to use that the Nautilus File Explorer, which I think is actually just labeled Files. We just changed our File Explorer to this. Now, obviously, it's still defaulting to the other one, but again, I can just hit Alt and Space to pull up my global search and just put default, oh, there it is, default applications, and pull it up, go to file manager and say, you know what, I wanna go ahead and change it to files, which is Nautilus, the new one, hit apply, okay, and then now when I actually pull up files by default, it'll go ahead and pull up my Nautilus. So pretty powerful stuff, one cool thing I like there. Now, some people don't see this out of the gate, and another thing that Windows users often conflate is Linux is the same like Windows, where it just always feels the same. Linux is this giant system to where you pick and choose what you want. You choose 
your file browser. You choose what desktop environment, how it looks. Like I made this look more Windows look and feel. Again, if, if you're interested in that, I made an entire video series, Windows to Linux, where you change Pop! OS to KDE, which that's what this desktop environment is. And if you're not sure what that is, again, just check that video series out. It kind of explains all that. But you, you feel kind of so in control. You can control everything with your system. You see what exactly is on it. Like, let's say I don't want this Gwyn view. I can just purge that, that file just by going dash R Gwyn view, typing my password, and then it says, hey, do you want to remove these packages? Yes. All right. We're done. And then you go back in here and guess what? Gwynview is no longer there. It, it's so fast, so intuitive. Everything works just a lot faster. And, and honestly, you don't have to use terminal. I've just explained it. I know a lot of Windows users are running down to the comment going, aha, you terminal junkie. I just use it because it's so easy. I already know the commands. I've learned it. And I keep learning more and more stuff to make it just so much faster than the Windows counterpart. Typing start run appwiz.cpl, scrolling down, finding the program, clicking it, hitting uninstall. It pops up another graphic thing. Hey, do you sure you want to install it? Yes, uninstall. Oh, but what about this other add-in? Do you need to uninstall that too? And you're like, okay, yeah, I guess next. And, and ah, progress bar. Okay, it's finally done. Close, finish. Oh, yeah, let me close this window, this window. That, just explaining that. Now, that didn't include transfer time, all that stuff with Windows here in Linux, you just do it. And it's just like that, just done. And and that's one thing I love uh, about Linux, why uh, a lot of the things, but it's not an overnight process. When I first got in here, I was lost. And a lot of the stuff I'm like, well, I did this like this in Windows. And I'm like, where, where the hell, how do I play games? Oh my God, I, I can't do anything in Linux. And well, I'll hit my little hotkey, pull up my browser here. So we'll go ahead and pull up Luchers.net, and let's say there's a game that I wanted. I was like, okay, well, what game do I, I want to play on here? And I'm like, oh, you know what? I really like World of Warcraft. And I just type it in the search box, and it goes, oh, World of Warcraft. Does that actually play on Linux? Oh, it's Platinum. Installs and runs flawlessly. Well, that's cool. Well, I've already installed Lutris on my system, so I can install pretty much any of these games on the website. So I'll just hit install. What happens? Oh, okay. It pulls it up. I guess I'll click install again. And then, yeah, we'll put it into that path. World of Warcraft under Titus Games. That sounds good. And we'll hit install. Well, this is kind of weird. I mean, as far as installing games, instead of going to the game website and hitting install, I can just go to this one website and install a whole variety of games into its own launcher. Now, obviously, if I didn't want to use Lutris, I can always use Steam. Steam is, works the exact same way as it does on Windows, where Lutris is just kind of a secondary Steam that is uh, a lot more compatible with a whole variety of different launchers, whether you're using Origin, Battle.net, even Bethesda, although Bethesda launchers, ugh. And then, you know, just, just as an illustration of its capabilities, you got League of Legends, which is its own independent launcher. All that can be installed and used during Lutris. So this just goes ahead and, and does it all for me. And I think I even got a comment on one of the videos going, well, uh, Linux doesn't do World of Warcraft. It doesn't do this game, you know, fill in the blank. And really, if you're really curious to see where it goes, yeah, just get on here and try it. So we'll go ahead and hit continue. And this just kind of walks us through everything. In my opinion, when you have a game that is rated well as far as compatibility goes, and there's a lot of games, a lot of popular games that are rated well in Linux, you can just hit install and play them. It's, it's getting to the point where the average day person can do this. It's not like this hacky guy that is, you know, done IT for years and years and years, and he's been on Linux for, you know, five years, and he's read all the books. It's not like that anymore. Linux can be used by the average day person, which is pretty darn amazing. So with that, World of Warcraft is installed and I can just hit launch and then it'll go ahead and pull up the Battle.net launcher. From the Battle.net launcher, I'd go ahead and sign in, uh, put all my details in and just use it like I would on Windows. Very easy.
it's easier than Windows. It can be like that. That's that's why I, I really, really enjoy this. And one of the reasons why I kind of talked through that whole process so you could see how long it took any extra steps so I didn't have to do any jump cuts or anything like that. So I don't want to pull the wool over your eyes. There still are games that don't work on here. And let's say you want to find a game that doesn't work. You can actually go to Lutris, type it in here. It'll tell you platinum, gold, silver, bronze, and then borked. And if it's borked, it's not going to play very well or not play at all. So uh, that's one thing about Lutris to know is it, it does show you what it is. Silver can require some hacks. You have to kind of read the instructions. It just depends on what it is. But just to illustrate some other big games like this right here is gold. Works flawlessly. And to get some of the performance tweaks, you can go ahead and change that. However, I think you can actually do a default installation with uh, steam on warframe now to where it just works out of the box and read the little patch notes here because there sometimes there is drawbacks not everything works perfectly out of the box and then if you're on steam and you want to know hey does this windows based game play on steam for linux well you can go to protondb.com and you can see what's there. So this kind of gives you popular games right now. Uh, out of the top 10, 60% of them are gold plus, meaning they pretty much just install and play just fine. Uh, top 100, 62% plus. Uh, top 1,000, almost a, a 60%. So 59% here. This is amazing. When I started using this last year in October of 2018, all these numbers were in the 30s and 40s. So when I say... It's come a long way. I mean, it's come a long way in a short period of time. And all these other red ones you're seeing, like Player Unknown Battlegrounds, Fortnite, a lot of the ones with easy anti-cheat, they're working on getting it right now. I just saw a tweet today. It's in beta. It will come out. When that happens, you're going to see about a 10% 10, 10 plus jump all across the board over here. And more things are going to be compatible. And if you saw my other video about the frame rates being better in Linux compared to Windows counterpart in certain games, that is also happening and it keeps getting better and better where it used to only work on a couple obscure games where they would play a little bit better in Linux. The number just keeps creeping up and up. But other than that, you have a, a little bit of this background. I, I kind of went and this is kind of like a hacky thing, a hobbyist kind of thing. But I'm going to break this down for the everyman in an upcoming video as well. And I just like the task tray. Just so many aspects of Linux I really enjoy. But again, it works fundamentally different. How to install programs, how to install games. All these things aren't the same as it is in in, Linux, or in Windows, and that's why uh, it requires a substantial time investment to learn these things. But I kind of want to just show just the basics for those that want to compare the two. Uh, hopefully on the Windows side, you picked up a couple tips and tricks, and then on the Linux side here, uh, maybe you picked up a, a little bit of something just out of that little thing I just did right there. Now, a lot of uh, differences in Linux, and some of the things that people get turned off by is all the options. You have options for everything. And when I mean everything, I mean everything. As far as what's the distribution go, you know, do I recommend an Arch-based or a Debian-based and all these other aspects? Well, that's just personal preference. And that's why for Windows users starting off, I have that entire guide uh, to kind of help lean you into a more Windows-friendly environment. And then just remember, this is the one thing I have to say about Linux is everything can be changed there's something you don't like and you're like, you know what? I really like this about Windows, but I hate it about Linux. Look into what that something is and then change it to what you need and what you want. Now, when it comes to Linux here, this is a bit of a learning curve. There's so many things uh, as a Windows user coming into Linux. I was just like, well, Windows has this or Windows does this differently and you can't think that way. You have to kind of break yourself of it. You're totally going to think that way when you first jump on the actual operating system. You're like, okay, how do I install programs? How do I do this? All of it works fundamentally different. The operating system itself works fundamentally different. Probably a, a good way to highlight this is how it handles device drivers. <laughs> and that's kind of funny because I said device drivers. Windows has device drivers. 
Linux really doesn't. How Linux actually operates or all those drivers are built into its brain, its kernel. And you just power on a Linux box and it should recognize everything in your system and everything should just work out of the gate. Where when you power on your Windows box, it's gotten better as far as installing drivers for you, but it's using this really archaic kernel that basically tacks on all this new equipment to that kernel and, and makes your system function after downloading the drivers or how it came with the installation CD. It installs it on the system afterwards. So it's a very, uh, a little more modular and a lot more things go wrong when it comes to that, when it comes to Windows. However, with Linux, it's all just kind of there as a whole. So fundamentally different. And, and there's so many aspects. I could honestly make a video a series over how different Linux is from Windows. So just keep that in mind. Uh, switching to Linux or using Linux is a fundamentally a different experience than using Windows. And after you stop making Linux act like Windows or stop trying to make Linux act like Windows, uh, you'll have a much better time because you're going to be learning, you're going to be doing all those things uh, that you should be doing in Linux. Overall, obviously, I've transitioned to Linux, as I've said, but it, a lot of people don't talk about how that happened. As a lifetime Windows user, how was that transition? I always say about 60 days in uh, before I actually really started becoming more comfortable with Linux and using Linux how most people should actually use Linux as far as a desktop environment goes. And that is a, a big transition. There, it was a lot of hurt, a lot of growing pains as I tried to almost de-learn some of the things I was accustomed to in Windows and transition into Linux. But overall, having all that control with Linux is well worthwhile. Whenever I move back to Windows, I'm always a little agitated by so many decisions I don't no longer make. Windows basically says, hey, this is how it is, and you can't do anything about it. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess I just have to modify or work around that limitation of Windows. So that's kind of how it is. And as far as the future goes for the operating systems, we've already kind of talked about how Windows has just been on this slow decline over probably the past decade. And Linux has just constantly, year after year, done all these improvements to where now we have gaming, we have all these aspects of Linux that are starting to actually not only compete with Windows, but beat them. And I've done many videos over this. I did just recently, uh, I'll link it up here, how Linux benchmarks in some games were actually getting more FPS on Linux than on Windows, even though these were Windows-based games, which is pretty insane when you think about it. So for all those Windows users out there, obviously Windows versus Linux, I say it's a, a learning period to switch to Linux. That's where the future is. However, I understand some people are just not ready to make that jump because you do have to retrain your brain. You do have to learn a new operating system. And when you're so used to Windows and you've spent all that time back in the 90s and 2000s learning Windows is ins and outs, learning a whole new system is a lot to take on. So that's why some people are just saying, hey, uh, I'm sticking on Windows and that's that. But I want to leave you with this final thought. Windows itself, I think, will continue the way many corporations do because there's no real trailblazer. There's no leader in, in the Microsoft space that is improving Windows. It's just slowly getting worse and worse. And I think that'll just continually just do a steady decline. There's no real improvements or things they can do to this really archaic old structure because everyone's so familiar with it and it's why they use Windows. Where Linux is still kind of a, a, a hobbyist's dream, there's still a lot of things that they're improving, like a lot of things. Every single month or week, I'm seeing a new article about a new feature that's being added, um, improvements to existing features, gaming, all these other things that just traditionally weren't done in Linux are being done and improved upon on a, almost a daily basis. So that was kind of the differences. People choose one because they just hate change and they're just incapable of changing. And then you choose Linux just because you kind of want to see that bleeding edge. And I truly do think this is what people will be using in the future. So 
it just depends on where you are on that scale and if you're stuck in the past which would be windows i totally understand that and, and by all means you can keep doing it i just kind of wanted to educate you on some things to at least make yourself a little more efficient in windows because they keep changing the menu systems and other things that uh, are really kind of just annoying and then kind of what options you have as far as Linux goes. Now, if you're wanting to make that leap, I've done an entire video series, Windows to Linux, where I do Pop! OS because I think it's the most friendly to a new Windows user, and I like a lot of their stock settings, so you're not having to do too much tinkering and things to get it perfect. But overall, it still requires a lot of effort uh, when, you know, obviously you have your Windows. So, that's kind of what this channel is about is just give you options and that's why I made this video to kind of lay out those options so you better understand why you choose a certain thing. Some say one is superior to the other. It just depends on the person, where you stand, where you're at and what you want out of your computer. A lot of these people out there don't even use desktop environments anymore or don't even use desktops or laptops. A lot of them are using tablets and Android systems and those types of things which I get you know if you're just using it for web browsing um, you know you're probably one of the easiest people out there you'll use your iPad or something else however if you're using a desktop and all you're doing is web browsing you probably should use Linux because it's far more secure uh, you're gonna have a better experience you're not gonna have updates jammed down your throat among other things but if you're a power user on Windows and you're using Adobe you're using other aspects of it such as Microsoft Office and these proprietary programs that are built and that you've built in a career around you're kind of stuck on windows so i mean there's that aspect as well so you know it just depends on what you're doing i personally believe once linux gets enough users a lot of these proprietary programs on windows will move over to linux but i think that's not for at least another couple of years just because i think for Linux to really force like a, adobe is probably the biggest one the adobe creative suite that's not on linux for that really to move over, I think Linux would need at least probably a 10% market share. And at that point, uh, Adobe would be missing out on millions, if not billions of dollars. And I think they'd have to be forced to switch at that time. However, right now they can pretty much ignore Linux because I think it's hovering around a three to 4% market share, which is pretty darn good. It's almost doubled in the past year, which is a, a very impressive. But at the same time, there's still a lot of growth that happened. And I think we're gonna see a lot of that growth in the coming years and uh, it's still not going to knock windows off anytime soon uh, if anybody's looking to go hey when is windows actually going to be uh, less than 50 percent of the market share uh, we're looking at least a decade out because people hate change and that's just kind of how it is and if anything from this video i think you can definitely take away that uh, a lot of people are familiar with windows and they've spent 20 years understanding it as an operating system and they have all their programs everything's in that operating system to change and switch over a lot of times a big deal and i think too many people make light of that and just say oh we'll switch to linux no and you'll never hear me say oh it's it's such an easy thing you just install this and everything's going to be exactly the same how you know it on windows that is never the case and i don't want you to take away from that they're fundamentally different but that's a good thing and i really enjoy the path linux is on and windows who knows maybe they'll get their act together and stop pushing out really bad updates and actually listen to their customer base and turn things around it's all possible uh, so that's kind of how it goes if everything stays the same and both chart a path path to the future uh, i think linux will obviously come out ahead here in about five to ten years i think it'll really be a major force in the market uh the desktop market that is obviously when it comes to servers and business it's already there it already pretty much took over but when it comes to actually windows right now uh they haven't shown really any improvements in probably about 10 years there's been little knickknack stuff that's been tacked on that have been an improvement such as a lot of how it handles drivers and how it downloads drivers automatically and installs them has gotten better compared to like windows 7 but a lot of other things has gotten worse and there's been a lot more bloat and again i've done a million videos on that but overall, that's kind of the path that both these operating systems are on. And it's just good to know you have options. And whether it's Windows or Linux, hopefully you got some educational value out of this video. And I'll see you in the next one.